Live from Dr. Henry Armitage Memorial High School AV Room, welcome to the latest episode of the Horror Pod Class. My name is Tyler, and I run Signal Horizon, a magazine dedicated to exploring genre fiction in and out of the classroom. And I'm Oren Gray, Monster Ambassador and Spread It Content Creator here at Signal Horizon. I love that content creator, creepy content creator for sure. <laughs> Tonight on the Horror Podcast, we are going to spend some time talking about what we've been watching and reading. We're going to help you find some free genre content on the internet. And finally, we are going to spend the remainder of the episode with our special guest, author Matthew Bartlett. Woo! He and the rest of us here are going to uh, celebrate uh, the 20-year anniversary of one of his favorites. And I got to say, after a revisit, one of my favorites, Session 9. But before we get there, Oren, what have you been reading? What have you been watching? What's going on uh, at uh, Castle Grayskull? <laughs> um, I'm still reading uh, John Langan's Children of the Fang, like very, very slowly, making my way through it. It's really good. I'm just being slow. Um, and then, like, all I've been watching lately is, like, weird old trash on Amazon Prime. So, like... Um, Dr. Blood's Coffin, I finished up uh, while I was Ooh, doing that sounds today. Great. Yeah, it's it's less great than it sounds. Um, it's fine, it's fun, but it's kind of slow. Um, and like Night of the Devils, which is um, an Italian vampire movie. Um, so stuff like that. Okay, no, that's cool. Uh, so let's rewind for a second. Talk to me, uh, you put on Twitter, and I'm dying to know, because I haven't read uh, Langan's newest collection, what is this about a phantom T-Rex? So, yeah, so one of the stories um, is about a ghost of a T-Rex. Um, like, okay. It's got, um, so basically, like, the premise of the story is that there's a ghost sort of, um, I guess, like, ghost X-Files. Like, there's these ghost people, the people who are dead, and, and their ghosts hang around to make sure things work the way they're supposed to when people die, I guess. Okay. And um, a ghost of a T-Rex gets involved. <laughs> of course. Um, that... and, and because it's John Langan, like, it's super, you know, credible and doesn't seem ridiculous somehow. Because that's his gift is to take the weirdest, stupidest premise and make it not seem stupid or weird. Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's a wide carnivorous guy. I think it's the the titular story there is essentially about like uh, the creeper from Jeepers Creepers. Only he lives in a weird outer space coffin, and right. he and like what what if, it, it, it's what if a vampire was also a satellite? Yeah, yeah, and um, not. Not for a minute are you like, what the fuck is this, John Langan? Right. You're like, John Langan is a you know is a is a master of his craft. Yeah. Yep. I, I love that description that he could take anything and make it seem scary and professional and yeah. Yeah. yeah very good. Very it, good. It's, it is the thing I envy most about his writing is just like the, his ability to make the most absurd premise not seem absurd at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. And well deserved of any kind of accolade that we could give him. We've had him here on the show before. Uh, I think maybe it's almost time to get him back on. It's been what, been a little while. What movie? So. I don't even remember what movie. Oh, it was the Larry it. Fessenden film. Um, oh. Martin? I think, I think it was that, Martin. I think that was before my time. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. It was like halfway through the second season. But he is also is just a fantastically brilliant movie critic. So, mm -hmm. like... Having him on to talk about movies is is pretty rad because I don't know he just sees shit that nobody else does so yeah he's, he's pretty great. cool guy yeah um, and you mentioned a couple other movies where can they find those movies at those are all streaming on Prime so yeah all right like Pr Prime is for its many flaws a cornucopia if you want to watch like weird the shit that you would have found when you were flipping through channels like. 40 years ago that if you want to find that there's a hundred million titles of that on prime. They're great. Yeah. What a great way to kill an afternoon, you know, like uh, for real, a great way yeah, to get caught it, up on, on things you haven't seen. Very good. Very good. Well, uh, my tastes are very diverse and not necessarily movie oriented over the last couple of weeks. Um, for one, 
We have finally finished a show. It's been out for a long, long time, but it's a documentary called The Vow, and it's all about um, essentially the cult that uh, was founded in Albany, New York, um, by this guy that was like a genius. Um, the name of the cult was like Inexium. Inexium, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, Inexibm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're probably most famous for uh, a subcult within the cult of only women who uh, essentially branded themselves on the vagina with um, uh, the letters of the leader of the cult. Um, it, yeah. Anyways, the series, like I spent the last four episodes like turning to my wife and saying, what the hell? No way. What the hell? No, you know, like. And I understand when you're in the cult, uh, you wake up one day and you're like, hey, let's storm the Capitol. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, it's hard from an outsider's perspective uh, to, to get it. I would say definitely creepy, horror adjacent, good enough for me. Uh, yeah, and uh, you, your friend and mine, Brock, uh, Brock Wilbur, yeah. local Kansas City guy, helped to, you know, crack that case. So. Yeah. Uh, and Brock's a great guy. You can, he's the editor in chief now of the pitch, which is our, uh, independent, I think you call it the sleaze rag of Kansas city or something like that. Newspaper. Yeah. 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 I I love that. But, uh, yeah, they do great stuff at the pitch too. So, um, I did that and then down a weird rabbit hole, uh, both Nicole and I, uh, checked out WandaVision, which is the new Marvel cinematic TV show Mm -hmm. on Disney plus. And WandaVision is amazing. Like I, Nicole wasn't as high on it as I was, but it is simultaneously incredibly charming and incredibly unnerving because like, as, as I have read about it, each episode like takes place in a sitcom universe of a different era. So the first two episodes are like from the fifties and the sixties. And it's very like um, I don't like leave it to beavery. Very mm-hmm. uh, I don't have like a black and white sitcom from that era, right. uh, except you get these moments of elucidation, right? Where people are like, "What the fuck's going on?" Right? And they're trying to figure out. And obviously, it's going to have like a lost style mystery that they're building to. But it's so goddamn charming. I don't know. I, I just smiled through the whole thing, uh, but also. It was like, man, I am really uncomfortable and I have no <laughs> idea why. Yeah. Everybody it's, seems to like it. I'm really looking forward to like six episodes in when they reveal a big twist and everyone hates it. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're Which like, is inevitable. Like anytime everyone likes something that's coming eventually. Like, yeah. Yeah. They're like, this is so weird. It's great. And then the showrunners are like, awesome. We don't know where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is not, uh, directed by Damon, Lind- uh, Damon Lindelof. So, uh, you know, Hey, maybe it will be uh, a little better. <laughs> Looks like we're getting in some comments here. Uh, random, but amazing films on Amazon. Eric, uh, you're hundred percent right. We'll flash up here. Uh, I, I just think it's pretty amazing. Um, you know what they all have to say. So yeah. Uh, release all the episodes at once. I binge it in an evening. Yeah. WandaVision for sure. It's one of those shows that I think benefits from a weekly release. Yeah. Um, so some other things coming out on VOD this week is a brilliant little film called La Casa. It's a Spanish language horror film, obviously about a haunted house, but, uh, like it's, it's stick is it's a movie sold in real time. So like a cop enters a haunted house and, essentially you follow him around Mm -hmm. and uh while that that idea that premise seems very hackneyed it has some of the coolest best scares like best little monsters in it that Mm -hmm. uh i've seen in in so long so it's a, a film not on too many people's radar but you cannot go wrong with la casa if you want something that uh it, it takes older haunted house tropes, but makes them freaking creepy, which I think is uh, not always the easiest thing. So yeah, that sounds awesome. And I think uh, that's pretty much it. There are a couple other things I think I may talk about on the next episode, but I've just kind of been, uh, you know, I've, I've just kind of been trying to to get through my to be watched list. So yeah, 
Real quick, uh, we try to talk a little bit of news this season, and uh, the big news for us, certainly for you, Oren, is that they moved up the release of Godzilla vs. Kong to yeah, uh, mid-March. On to the service I don't have, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, like uh, HBO Max is um, an okay service to use. Maybe you know somebody that is the editor-in-chief of a <laughs> small to mid-market uh, magazine that may give you his login. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm going to have to get I'm gonna have to get it at some point because Malignant is going to come out on it, and I will have to get it for that, 100%. So yeah. whenever yeah. that happens. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what King Kong vs. Godzilla is like, because King of the Monsters was kind of a mess so uh. yeah. uh but here's the thing i i think it maybe this is me being hopeful <laughs> that uh, biden is president uh we, we have lots of reasons to be hopeful right uh but from the poster i feel like we're gonna get a lot more monster which is I, our, our biggest complaint of the last godzilla film the monsters were great the people were freaking terrible so uh, so we'll see. I don't know. Um, it's uh, it's Adam Wingard, right, directing it. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really curious. I'm really curious to see you know what it's like. Like we've definitely never seen Wingard tackle anything with a budget like that before. So oh, I'm really yeah. curious to see you know how that plays out. Well, and if you're watching live, they promised the release of the trailer sometime this weekend. My guess is probably before a football game or something like that. So. Keep an eye out on your, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your favorite social media service is. Uh, I'm sure it'll go gangbusters once it comes out. I think probably it's a conversation for a later day, but I think this big push to put everything on HBO Max is great for those of us that have HBO Max and are terrified of still going to a movie theater. But I don't know if it's um, a wonderful plan long term for what we're doing, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's been i mean it's definitely been rolled out in a really weird way and it wasn't great for the creators i know and it's just been kind of a mess but you know everything's been kind of a mess so yeah that that pretty well describes i think everybody's life yeah. right now so yeah, yeah. very good um, and i i i did want to mention since we're talking about movie release dates i literally just saw before i got on here i was on like letterboxd or somewhere and there was like a scrolling ad that antlers has a release date again in October. So yeah, um, that's we, a long ways from now, but we all need a little wind to go in our lives. <laughs> so I, it's going to be so disappointing when we finally see it. Like we've been hyped <laughs> up for it for so long now. I know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if we have a handful of writers that live here in Kansas city and uh, I like to take all the writers and all the staff here to the movies that we're really excited about. So the last one was The Lighthouse, and it was great. I think we had five or six people go, and it was a, it was a hoot, right? A million years ago. A million, yeah. yeah. But I have a feeling Antlers is going to be the next uh, like field trip. So here's hoping. Yeah, Here's hoping by October. That's yeah, at, a, that's a feasible thing. Yeah. At at this point, um, there could be a tent with a sign that says vaccine and it could be antifreeze and I would let him inject it into my arm because I'm just so sick of this shit. So, yeah, um, here's to not doing that in real life. Please don't do that. Uh, <laughs> we want to maintain the 11 fans that we have. So. We do not advocate the use of antifreeze as a cure for COVID. No, no, not at all. <laughs> all right. Well, um. Let's move on to our dark corners of the web. Uh, we have a podcast favorite tonight. Anya Martin is a really accomplished writer. She's also one of the big wigs with uh, the Weird Symposium. So uh, the Outer Dark is you know one of her babies, and they do a fantastic job over there. So you should check out this story that is available for free from Broken Eye Books called All the Things We Need to Kill Squish which is going to be published in an upcoming anthology called Cootie's Shot Required. And uh, it is fun and creepy and just incredibly well written for being like a silly story, you know. But uh, I have found that there is a certain level of whimsy that comes along with a lot of Anya's stuff. And uh, I, the story is is 
it was pretty spot on. So that's cool. I haven't actually read it yet, but yeah, it's know, it's. I'm, I'm planning to. I just haven't haven't had it yet. So yeah, I, I think it's uh it's totally worth it. And Broken Eye Books have done uh, a number of things before, so yeah. like. Uh, I trust them. I know that anthology is going to be super interesting. However, I haven't read anything about it. So I like, <laughs> have you had your cootie shot? I'm not exactly sure um, what what that will entail. So yeah, I don't yeah. Know. it could, um, could be interesting. Yeah, they do good stuff. Um, they're doing my, uh, my cyberpunk novel, serialized cyberpunk novel right now on their Patreon. So. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Well, uh, I look forward to watching that, but also um, <laughs> uh, watching that and hope that your cyberpunk uh, book does a little better than the cyberpunk 99 or whatever, you know, whatever that game was or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Um, that uh, has probably, not done I mean, well. Probably not. Honestly, no. But, you know, I, Stop. I, I, Stop. <laughs> well, I can see from our lobby that we have a wonderful uh, Matthew and Bartlett waiting in the wings. So let's bring Matthew in and head to our essential question uh, today. Hey, Matt, are you there? I'm here. Can you not? Let's see. Am I? Am I visible? Uh, you're, you're not visible. You are oh, not you know visible, what? but you are a oh, disembodied what? voice. Yes, now there you are. Hey, uh, there you are. Welcome. Welcome to the show, Matt. How's it you. going? It's going all right. I got to figure out how to line up the camera here so I'm in the middle of it and not <laughs> off to the side. How are you guys doing? Uh, we are great. We are great. So uh, here's what we're going to do before I formally uh, uh, you know, give you your introduction. We uh, are going to introduce our essential question and then watch the trailer together so we can uh, get a brief review of that. But tonight's essential question is, how does Session 9 explore the complex world of masculinity? And here is the trailer coming to you very soon. I gotta get construction crews in here by Columbus Day, so you gotta guess for how long? I've got four really good guys. One week, we're gone. That's fast. I need the job. So the loonies are outside in the real world, and here we are with the keys to the loony bin, boys. <laughs> you might actually want to be grateful, and you're about to make some decent money. What's the catch? Patricia Willard scandal, 1984. I want you to try to remember what happened 24 years ago. Use your imagination. The shrinks figured that with these new techniques they designed, they could release hidden memories. You can hear me. You okay? I want to go home. I wouldn't tell anybody about this. If they find out about Hank, they're going to find out about the others. We have the others. When I come home, I am so sorry. All right, Matthew Bartlett is one of the most intriguing authors in the publishing business today. Uh, He's one of my all-time favorites, and his works include The Stay Awake Man and Other Unstable Entities, Gateways to Abomination, and Other Books of Supernatural Horror. His short stories have appeared in a variety of anthologies, including Lost Signals, A Breath from the Sky, Year's Best Weird Fiction, Volume 3, and one critic of whom I admire greatly describes his work as stream of consciousness if the stream was a radio station and the consciousness was an alien. Matt Bartlett, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> Thank you. I'm still trying to, I have this new laptop and like my head is uneven with all the heads. So I'm trying to get everything straight now. So. Now uh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. But I'm here. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So 
uh, I've been dying to get you on the show. And, uh, you know, kind of one of the rituals of getting new folks on the show is, uh, you know, I ask them, what movie do you want to talk about? And, and hopefully it's not something that we discussed before. And this was one of the first ones you mentioned. Why Session 9, man? Um, it's one of my favorite all-time horror movies. Um, just the uh, the atmosphere. Um, it's all, uh, except for a couple of, you know, outdoor scenes and scenes uh, um, across from a house. All the interiors are shot in the Danvers um, State uh, Asylum in uh, Danvers, which used to be called Salem, uh, Mass., um, and there, is, there used to be one of uh, uh, one of those buildings in Northampton, Mass, where I where I lived uh, for a while. And I've been inside, but not much beyond, you know, like a stairwell, you know. Uh, and so, so you've actually been inside of this place? Only in the stairwell, because that's still crazy, though. It is, and for a while, I actually took a piece of uh, concrete and I had it in my car for a while, but. Um, my fear wasn't so much um, like ghosts or evil entities so much as the police. So I didn't really go. <laughs> the real far. scary monsters. The yeah. Real yeah. Scary monsters. <laughs> yeah. Right. And at that time I had not seen um, session nine or I probably would have thought more about asbestos being a problem, but um, right. yeah. So anyway, it's just, it's always been one of my favorite movies. Um, I like that it is, um, I don't know. It's just to me, it's one of the more scary horror movies out there without being like, you know, a bloodbath. And um, I like that it's kind of character and dialogue driven psychological horror. And, and it's got secrets that it holds back, which I which I like as well. And you can find something new, I think, every time you watch it. Yeah, it, it had been uh, a few years since I'd seen it last, and and there are so many kind of subtle things that I pick up. And I I had just watched uh, Memento. I had a student that was talking to me about it, and uh, and so I went back and I watched Memento, and then I saw this movie. I don't know a few weeks later, and it is surprising how similar the feel, the spookiness, the like. That that unreliable narrator or whatever uh, it is kind of brings to things. Oren, yeah. is this a is this a fan favorite of yours? Oh or? yeah, I love this movie. Um, yeah, I love this movie. It's uh, it's a really good example of like where execution matters. Like because you know the plot of the movie, if you just render it down to the basic elements of its plot, there's not that much to it right it doesn't it sounds like it could easily be not that good like there's tons of other you know shitty director video movies that have essentially the same plot um but like it's all in the execution and the way it builds dread and the way it it you know feels like the vibe of the movie is just mm -hmm. so oppressive and amazing and weirdly light like there's weirdly like there's a lot of light which is strange for horror yeah. like um but it's really unpleasant still. Like, I don't know. It's really good. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the light. Cause that was one of the things that really stood out to me in this rewatch was uh, the different way that the camera, and I don't, I didn't write down who the cinematographer was here, but is able to catch these beams of light, right. Mm -hmm. That make the whole thing feel very theatrical, but also really strange, you know? And, uh, it's another movie that I would put on my list of movies that you could turn into a stage play, I think, very, very easily, because most of the deaths happen off stage. you know? Mm, that's true. And a lot of it is a man in the basement of an asylum listening to an audio tape. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, somehow isn't boring, you know? Like, it, that is the creepiest element, I think, of that the whole movie, so... Well, there's a point where the evil entity says, uh, when the doctor asks on tape, what happened on this Christmas night in Lowell? And the evil entity, Simon, says, use your imagination. And that's what you end up doing through a lot of the, because you're, you don't see, as, as you said, the, a lot of the, the violence uh, takes place uh, off stage or it's cut away from before it happens um there's blood but there's not you know 
well, <laughs> there's a lobotomy <laughs> that happens. On, <laughs> but yeah. uh, that happens. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. But by, by and large, you know, you're kind of left with, um, what you picture in your head. And, and that's one thing I like about this kind of movie and where it can fall for somebody, I think is similar to Blair Witch Project. If, if someone doesn't bring in their own imagination a little bit to bear, it might be less of an experience uh, uh, for them. Yeah. More so with Blair Witch, I think, than this. But I think this, this qualifies, particularly, you know, you're listening to this audio tape of a doctor interviewing a patient with multiple personalities which sounds lurid and silly but is played very straight mm -hmm. um there's a little bit of a wiggle in the audio tape which adds to the eerie effect you know the the doctor's voice wavers with the age of the tape um yeah, so yeah that's another thing i like about it well and and i think your discussion of having been in this hospital right having been in this place uh -huh. reflects i i don't know uh, I don't want to speak for you too, Oren, but like people that are into creepy shit, like, uh, are always looking for buildings or, you know, that kind of stuff. Case in point, uh, in college, we had an old asylum that got closed down. And so we would, uh, you know, have a beer or two or three or four or whatever and go out there. And they had the same thing though. They had like cassettes and, uh, suitcases full of clothing and old tables. And, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it felt like, People just disappeared in the middle of the night, and that only adds to the creepy ambiance, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. We uh, Friends and I went to a, um abandoned resort in Connecticut with, a, like, a emptied swimming pool with a chair at the bottom of it. And oh, wow. <laughs> a completely blown apart office and, and little, um, like, single unit living quarters and... Um, we were kicked out eventually, thankfully not arrested or anything, but there were, uh, my friend had gone and there were no, no trespassing signs. But when we went, they were up all over the place, but <laughs> we kind of forged ahead anyway. And a couple of guys in a golf cart came around and said, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just looking around, you know, but yeah, creepy places, abandoned places. Um, oh, yeah. always very alluring. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, now is the time. If you are checking us out live, feel free to leave a comment in a uh, little comment thing here on Facebook or Twitter, and we will uh, throw you up there and, and hopefully answer that question for you. But before we get too long, I want to return back to that question today, which is, like, clearly this movie is trying to engage in a conversation about, like, what it is to be a man, what it is to have responsibilities, what it is that, you know, like uh, the different roles that that have to be like uh, balanced. And I, either one of you want to talk some about, I don't know, what you see is, is that tension in this film? Sure, I can um, talk a little bit about it. I mean, obviously, the um, I think it's kind of drilled in early on that some of these men are, are, are ailing in a way. Uh, you've got Gordon, the uh, older man who's a new father, um, needs this work clearing uh, asbestos from this uh, facility to the point where he, uh, in order to get the work, he says, you know, they can do it in a week instead of the three weeks they initially agreed to. Um, the first thing you see is him sitting in his car and he's tired and but then you also have the David Caruso character who has lost his uh, uh, wife to another one of the workers. Um, so there's, you know, interplay between the two of them, um, kind of a, a heavy tension uh, between, the, between the two men. So you've got two characters who are um, not having a great time. <laughs> and it kind of teases a little bit, you know, who might be the one who's getting taken in by this, you know, and um, they've also got a kid working there, the nephew of Gordon, the uh, the man with the new baby, and he's uh, the butt of all the jokes. He's, you know, plays the radio too loud and they make fun of him and all this. So it's it's definitely, I, I don't think there are any women that appear in the movie except in, in, in voices, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not like, I wouldn't say it's 
a lot of dick waving. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's not, um, there's not a lot of posturing, which is yeah. another thing I like about it. It kind of it puts you in the world of these pretty realistic characters with, you know, Massachusetts accents and um, kind of a, a working class feel to them. And some of them kind of want a little bit more than that out of life. Um, so I'm kind of meandering here, but maybe. Uh, no, maybe I, I think can... I think you're doing a good job. All, right. all, all I was going to say was just that, like, so I, um, you know, I grew up, my dad was a contractor um, and most of the people I knew growing up were contractors. Like they worked these kinds of jobs and, you know, every job I've ever worked or been around that was like these kinds of jobs was filled with people like these kinds of people, like right. these people who were like they're damaged, but not in the sort of romantic way that like a noir character is damaged, right? They're just people who are having a shitty life. Right. They're beaten down. Yep. And, you know, they're they're desperate, but they're desperate in this kind of quiet, defeated way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it felt very accurate to that, like, and to every, not, not every, but virtually every person I've ever worked with in those kinds of crews. Um, and yeah, it, it really, really felt real in that way. Yeah, yep. I, I appreciate that, uh, that the movie goes out of its way to be generous to these characters that obviously have issues, right? Like, uh, it, it's not overly mean to them. And um, I think specifically, it that that quiet desperation, right, reminds me of I, I think it was thrower or Emerson or somebody said like uh, the, the, the world is full of live me living in quiet desperation or something like that. Right. Right. The mass of men lives in, in quiet desperation. Yeah. 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 Uh, And I think that is so integral because that, that life that they have really is the, the, the ultimate prison, right? Like uh, they're in the asylum, but it's their own lives that ultimately, and, you know, spoiler alert, uh, obviously, uh, if you have not watched the movie, you should go do that and they catch the second half of this episode. But like, it, it is the fact that this guy feels imprisoned, essentially, like by his family and by a number of other things that causes him to uh, go crazy, you know? Right. Well, yeah. And one of the fascinating things about the movie is that the, the horror of the movie comes from outside the asylum, right? Like he's already done it when the movie yep. starts. Right. Like it's already happened. It's it's he brings it with him to the asylum. Right. It's yeah. not it's not him, you know, becoming possessed by the spirit that's there. The spirit that's there echoes what he's done. Mm-hmm. Or whatever. But but the horror comes not from within the asylum, but from they bring it with them when they come in. Right. And they awaken something right. in the in the asylum yeah. that uh, that um perpetuates or, or furthers the the um the violence and yeah. there's um i took some notes when i watched it today and there's an early scene where david caruso's character goes into a room and there's pictures and clippings from old magazines and things like that on the wall and uh it, some of them seem to forecast a little bit what's what's going to happen uh, a little bit down the line i'm going to see if i can find this in my notes here but um, there's things on the wall that say, um, where is it? Uh, Suddenly it's going to dawn on you, all right, is one clipping that the camera kind of, and there's a little music cue in there. And um, under that or next to it is a picture of a mother and a baby. Now, spoiler alert again, <laughs> the, uh, the character who is the head of this asbestos team has, in a, in a fit of rage, having gotten uh, spoiling... Uh, pasta water poured on him accidentally when trying to get a little romantic uh, with his wife goes into a rage and, and basically kills his family. Uh, this is never shown. Um, it's you hear it. Um, all you really see is his car outside the house and him looking across the street, waiting to turn into the driveway and the wife and the baby are outside. So um, there's also a sign or a clipping that says night people and it shows cadavers um and here's the big one Uh, a man of peace an act of violence is one of the uh one of the clippings and then uh another one says 
and this I this I had to pause and creep right up to the TV to see it, but it says uh, because my heart belongs to Daddy, and uh, the last one is uh, no one will leave feeling neutral, which is kind of oh, a eerie. Wow. Yeah, odd. yeah. Uh. Also, also a description of most of the people who watch this film. I think. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we've got a question from somebody in the audience here. Uh, Logan wants to know, uh, is it okay, Matt or Matthew? Which, which do you prefer? Fine, yeah. Okay. Uh, does your interest in session nine, which relies a lot on audio recordings uh, and WXXT, your universe based on a radio station, speak to a larger interest in the idea of horror and audio? Yes. The short answer is yes. Um, I'm working on a series of chapbooks uh, that I'm putting out this year, a uh, chapbook per month. And that really actually figures in because there's a uh, ongoing serialized piece about a kid in a record store listening to not bootleg, but like found cassettes okay. that they sell at the store. Um whether it's prank calls or um, a strange band that plays in the woods. And, and throughout this series of chapbooks, uh, this kid is in the store listening to these audio tapes. So clearly I've got, yeah, I've got a, a big interest in um, hearing but not seeing um, as a way to spark uh, the imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead, Oren. Go, I was go just going to say, um, one of the things that is... Uh, really great about session nine, in my opinion, is that it, I'm really interested in things that subvert the uh, show don't tell uh. paradigm mm -hmm. um, and tell instead of showing. Right. Um, because I think a lot of times it's actually more effective. Um, mm -hmm. And like the, there's a sequence in session nine that's a really perfect example of it, which is the, the satanic panic reference sequence where he's telling the story of the, the girl getting institutionalized and all that stuff. And like he's telling it, and all you see, the camera's just watching bugs crawling on the grass. Yep. And it's creepy as fuck. Like, right? Yep. It's just this guy telling us telling a story that supposedly really happened, and you're just watching bugs crawl around. And it's you know, it's one of the creepiest scenes in the movie, right? It's great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. really it really does work. Well, and uh the town that she's from, right? And I'm blanking on the the name of it, but uh i I went and did some research a few days ago and like they had a real satanic panic there. It wasn't nearly as full blown as some of the bigger ones, but like mm -hmm. somebody spray painted like uh, a 666 on an underpass or something. And like town folks freaked out, you know, devil worshipers are here or whatever. And I, you know, I found that kind of a neat little tidbit that uh, we, we are including an element of reality into this film by using yep. the yeah. real um, asylum, by yeah. using these real places that, kind of blur that line, you know? Yep. yep. I mean, when I was watching the film and I, the notes I took, like I, I uh, compared it to a lot of the like cinema verite stuff that was happening, the dog may uh, 95 stuff and that kind of thing. Like it, it felt, it's not that level of lack of artifice, but you know, using the real asylum and using the very naturalistic kind of lighting and everything, it, it felt a lot more, stripped of artifice than a lot of movies of the time especially were because this was early 2000s which was you know the very slick shiny production value era of yeah. horror movies especially yeah it, it does have a, a grittiness to it or or something yeah that kind of yeah. sets it apart uh, have... i like particularly how understated the music was um a lot of times i because my wife, my wife is very sensitive to music, and I won't even notice it, and she'll be like, "This soundtrack is terrible." And then <laughs> suddenly, I'm cued into, I'm like, "Oh my god, this music is bad," you know, in various other movies. But I really like the quiet, sort of creepy, um, um, slow, not overstated. It doesn't jump out at you. Music that that kind of backs all of this stuff. It really, to me, really lends. To the, it really brings a lot to the atmosphere. Um, yeah, a little plinking piano and a little sort of slinky, um, a little bit on an organ or something. It's it's really well done. 
Yeah, it, it definitely like incorporates some elements of like haunted housey stuff, which uh, I, I think is more red herring than anything else. But it totally works to amp up the the creep factor, you know, the, uh-huh. the scare factor for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think the idea that each of these characters represents a version of masculinity, I think, is really important. And you can really pick all of that apart and approach each kind of character as a different stage of their life, right? Like that's why that young character is so important, right? We get this, like he's full of life and he, he, he has a levity to the way he walks and to how he talks and, you know, and nobody else does, you know, and they, they just look at this guy and they're like, Oh, this poor bastard, you know, both, you know, figuratively, but also literally by the end of the film. So I think, uh, I think it's pre- pretty darn interesting. Have have either of you guys seen the last broadcast? A long time ago. It's not fresh in my yeah, mind at all. Like, they like, feel like I have, but I don't ask me about it. <laughs> right. Okay. So it, it's a found footage film um, that uses that unreliable narrator to its uh, to its benefit very very well. But uh, it's also got an audio quality about it because they keep getting they essentially it's a it's a movie that was made in like the early. I'm going to say the the early to mid nineties. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the IMDB pulled up in front of me, but they are hosting instead of a podcast, right? Where they have fantastic authors that agree to come in and talk about uh, movies. They host this like local, like PBS network, you know, TV show. Right. And they'll have people call in, but because they're too cheap, they've got their computer hooked up to like, uh, anybody that sends like an early version of an email or whatever it is, the voice will modulate and speak for the the user. So you get this weird interaction between the main characters and the viewers of the show, because like the viewers of the show always operate in like computer voice, you know, and they're like, what about this? You know, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I, it just reminded me of the importance of the audio element to all of this, because if those tapes aren't believable, I don't think this film works in the least bit. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So is there importance to the fact that really the only female character we have in here, uh, is bad. Is she bad? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I think she's a victim, uh, just as our main character Gordon is, uh, in that she's inhabited by these various characters that are uh aspects of her personality except for one of them which is kind of a um a, a demonic for lack of a better word uh presence that that preys on the the vulnerability of um damaged people and um pushes them towards their worst instinct so i don't think the the female character is is a is a bad character She's just another another victim of uh, of this being, just as uh, as Gordon is. Okay, so is the because I, I like I think there are lots of ways to read the ending of this film. It sounds like uh, Matthew that you're very firmly in the it's a demonic entity that seems to be possessing um, both the woman but also our main character here. Or do we mm-hmm. just think he snapped? What like I don't know. What, is it fair to to say that you are firmly rooted in the demonic presence camp? <laughs> I am, and maybe that's just says something more about me than it does about the movie. I know there, are, <laughs> I know there are different interpretations. There's, um, I even was reading today that there are people who speculate that Gordon himself had been an inmate of that asylum prior to its closing, because at some point I think when they're touring he takes the lead a little bit and, and like he already knows the way Um, I don't really buy into that all that much, but I do think that the tape that the guy was listening to downstairs um, um, and the fact that the voice said, hello, Gordon early on when they were first touring (laughs) and he saw the wheelchair down the end of that long hallway Great shot. Um, yeah, I kind of, I kind of yeah. go. Yeah, I kind of go with the, uh, with the demonic entity. But again, that's that might be just me. Oren, uh, are you into demons? I mean, 
I'd like, why not both? Like, I mean, you know, I feel like the movie definitely implies that there's something going on more than merely him snapping Mm -hmm. because it connects the two narratives, right? Like it connects the narrative of the the girl on the tape and it connects with Gordon's narrative. Like there's clearly some kind of link between the two. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, you know, again, he killed his family before he ever got here. So, you know, Mm -hmm. like he's, and the the line, the really good line, um, you know, the the I live in the weak and the wounded, like it suggests that essentially Simon is the capacity for evil that lives in people uh-huh. already. Like, oh, I like and that. So it's already there in everybody before they show up. Like they don't have to right. come here and get possessed. He's already there. Yeah. The minute you know, the minute you the minute you suffer and start hurting and want to lash out, he's already there, you know, right. that's, that's ready to, right. Ready to, to fill that position. Oh. Right. Now, some yeah. of the interpretations I read seem to indicate that his killing his family didn't happen before the movie, but it happened uh, the evening after he first went into right. the asylum. Um, and I don't know because the movie is a little bit un- unclear on that. But um, it's definitely early on. Yeah, yeah. 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 One thing uh, I read that I found kind of fascinating was a, a parallel with uh, The Shining, um, and something that called attention to that was the fact that um, apparently in The Shining, when Nicholson is locked in the um, storage area. Near him is a jar of peanut butter and Oreo, and Oreo cookies. And in this movie, Gordon has in the car with him a thing of Jif and, Interesting. Uh, and Oreos. Um, as like a, just a little, uh, uh, what do you call it, an Easter egg um, to throw back to the mm-hmm. Shining. And, and both Jack's character and Gordon's character had a wife named Wendy. You know, And whether these things are kind of that, what was that movie about the Shining that um, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. There was a it's, lot of, to my thinking, a lot of sort of crackpot theories about uh, <laughs> some of them a little intriguing and some of them completely off the wall. Uh, so, about, so what yeah. I'm hearing uh, is that Matthew Bartlett believes this movie is about the moon landing and about the subjugation <laughs> of Native Americans. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> Isn't it clear? Yeah. <laughs> I think Section uh, 9 is, is proof that Stanley Kubrick faked the moon landing. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> You win the prize tonight, yeah. But this well, was it, this was two thousand and one, so I think this is more about um, the faking of nine eleven. Oh, um, all by, right. By, yeah. by director Brad Anderson. So. Yeah, don't you remember that line? Um, Jet fuel can't burn steel <laughs> beams, or something like that. I, it felt yeah, very it odd the, at the time. One of the clippings <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Bush did nine eleven, something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's very odd and out of place. I was like, "What is this about?" Yeah, <laughs> love it. Well, I think secrets of session nine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a piece that needs to be written by Signal Horizon. That's what it sounds oh. like. <laughs> well, the. Uh, the one thing that we have not talked about in the least bit, and we're running a little short on time, so we got to mention him a little bit, is uh, this is a David Caruso vehicle, man. Like, he is in this movie a lot doing very David Caruso things throughout the whole thing. So, I'm a David Caruso apologist. Um, I haven't really <laughs> seen much of that Miami show with the sunglasses and the... Yeah. <laughs> This, was this before that or contemporaneous to it? I it was believe before, it was before, right? but I yeah. could be Again. wrong. Um, yeah. But I think he's fantastic in this movie, and he also delivers the best uh, fuck you line uh, <laughs> yeah. in the stairwell, which I think, you know, when I first saw that, I think my friend and I rewound it like 40 times. Uh, <laughs> it and is I think good. it can be found on YouTube as just like that, you know, 1.3 second clip of fuck you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think David Caruso is terrific in this movie. Yeah, I, I really I, like I'm not trying to judge anybody's lifestyle by any stretch. I am I'm certainly not anti-drug, whatever gets you through the day, man. But like, you know, maybe smoke a pot before you clean out a bunch of asbestos 
is not the best idea. I like I don't know. I just feel like that's he's just getting ahead of the medical usage, right? <laughs> like when the asbestos gives him cancer, he'll have already smoked the pot. Oh, it's a preventative measure. Oh, no <laughs> shit. Oh, all right. Now, if you want to get into more kind of room two three seven, or in this case, I think it's room four 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 type of stuff. Um, there's a lot of things with masks, and they're kind of cavalier about wearing the masks. So oh, I like it. Might prefigure our our current situation. Uh, oh, such a nine predicted COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah th- this movie got infinitely more uh, disturbing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah like, there's I kind like... of social distancing. Um, <laughs> fortunately, they're in an airy building with a lot of ventilation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So. Right. They have definitely yeah. six feet apart. I, yeah, yeah. They're, they're probably okay. Yeah. Well, uh, somebody who I, I think it's it's fair to say that all of us really enjoyed this movie. Somebody uh, did not. And that would be our anonymous letterbox user. Now, we have a tradition here on the program uh, you can certainly say no, uh, Matthew, it's totally fine. But uh, we have cold the dark uh, abyss <laughs> of half star to one star letterbox reviews to try to come up with something uh, that is either funny or ridiculous or both. And uh, we like our guests to read the letterbox uh, review that we have found. Are you up to that challenge? I absolutely am. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I've got it. I've got it on my screen now. Perfect. All right. Uh, AAU, I think, is the maybe the initial of this person. Boo! STFU. This was boring and not scary at all. And if you're actually scared of it, I'm going to kick your kneecaps in. <laughs> boring cast. Boring story. The setting had so much potential, only for it to t- turn into another snooze fest that straight men overhype. What? If you're a straight man and you gave this movie more than two stars, I'm going to kick your kneecaps in. Y'all are hyper male until you watch this and suddenly you're scared of what? The dark? Grow a spine, little baby. And then there's like 40 frowny things. <laughs> yeah, like literally 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's a million of them. Yeah, I'm going to feed you to the asylum tunnels and laugh while you cry about it. And it would be more entertaining than this movie God. <laughs> well so, done. Well done. Uh, yeah. I, just, I, just really little... feel, I just really feel like this person just really wants to kick kneecaps in. He really does. There's a little drama there. And um, <laughs> this, uh, I think uh, Roger Ebert has nothing to worry about. Uh, I think his legacy is is safe. Although he did use a lot of emoticons in his reviews, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's going to store it on numbers of kneecaps kicked in. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm checking my kneecaps now, and they're they're intact. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. I, I have been called lots of things in my day, but like hyper masculine or whatever it is, because I thought this movie was scary. <laughs> like, all right, man. Okay, uh, I guess I'm 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 getting it. All right. Ooh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the person does seem to think that one's uh, gender and sexual orientation um, will predict how one feels about this movie and you know i don't know if that's true i think my 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 wife liked it i have not widely surveyed like like i feel like i feel like there's definitely a group of movies right there are movies where you can be like cishet straight movie critic dudes love these movies right yeah this is not one of those no 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 uh, like again, I, I'm not I'm not widely surveyed the non cishet movie critics and their opinions on session nine, but this isn't like this isn't like Nolan or something, right? Where you can be like, "Yep, cishet dudes fucking love Nolan," right? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but like, this is not one of those. I'm very confused. <laughs> yeah, what's the one that that uh, uh, people liked? It was an action movie, and the director was a, apparently a tyrannical uh, jerk. Uh, Billy Connolly was in it. Um, oh, um, Boondock Saints. Boondock yeah. Saints. Yeah, that's yeah. a major. That's yeah. a major one, and yeah. uh-huh. people like to call it out as a red flag. If uh, if a guy really likes that movie, then you should probably <laughs> yeah. come on, babe. Let's go back and watch Boondock Saints again. Yeah, <laughs> like, especially if they're older than like sixteen. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Ugh. maybe yeah. don't go back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, uh, we have uh, covered a ton of session nine tonight. Anybody have anything else to add before we wrap up tonight's conversation? 
No, I just I wonder if there's a T-shirt. I would love to have a session nine T-shirt. I've, I bet we be could one. scare one up. Be one. Yeah, I, I I will find a session nine T-shirt <laughs> and put the link in the show notes. How about that? Uh, so I want it really lurid though. I want it to look like uh like. Uh, hammer horror <laughs> movie. That would be amazing. Like the, the most inappropriate Section 9 t shirt. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like one of those uh, from Guyana or whatever, like right. version of the Session 9 poster. I, I think the only ones that I can find are like the hyper masculine ones that have everybody like all buff and, you know, like yep, jacked up. Muscling out. Yeah. Yeah. Rippling muscles and a AK 47. Yeah. 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 David Caruso with his glasses on. Yeah. 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 Freaking great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Matthew Bartlett, thanks again for coming on. I know you have a number of things coming out. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about um, some of your your stuff that we can expect here in 2021? Sure. Um, I had a chat book um, from Dim Shores in 2015 called Rangel. Um, That came out in two different editions that are both long sold out with fantastic illustrations by uh, Aaron Alfrey, who did the cover and the interiors, and he's done work for Legati, incredibly uh, a real visionary of, of the grotesque, you know? Cool. Um, so I'm working with him again, and we're going to put out a third edition of the book with a new variant cover, uh, all the original illustrations, plus a brand new two-page uh, illustration that's epic. I think he's sort of like the Hieronymus Bosch of today. Cool. And I think this, this new piece really speaks to that. Um, that I'm going to put out myself, and I'm working with Dim Shores on a sequel to that book. Cool. Um, so those are two biggies. Um, I have a book, uh, a sort of novel called The Obsecration, coming out from Broken Eye uh, Books, who I think you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the big thing that uh, is pretty much my main source of income right now is a chapbook series called the uh, WXXT Program Guide, vignettes and serialized short stories uh, spread throughout 12 chapbooks, uh, one for each uh, month of 2021. I'm mailing out, excuse me, the um, January issue tomorrow and probably going to print, going to the printer with the February issue within a week or so. Nice. So Wonderful. Well, that sounds like all kinds of really cool projects that uh, you have coming up. I love that, that serial idea, you know, that, not not too many people do that anymore. I remember when King did it for uh, Green Mile, and you know my nerdy ass was there every day. You know when a new one came out, so yeah, very cool. Well, yeah, this best... is kind of neat because it's serialized short stories. So a story might might begin in the January chapbook and then pick up again in May. You know, it's fun to kind of and then uh, of course as I like to do, uh, they begin to suggest to me ways that they might interrelate and interweave. So. Um, it's, it's a good deal of fun and it's really getting the, getting the juices flowing creatively. So, well, very good. I'm, I'm sure you have many more people like me that absolutely love your work and are, you know, really jazzed, uh, to see so much new, new content coming out. Uh, if they want, if they want to like, um, you know, see what you're doing, uh, on your own time or whatever, do you have social media that, uh, people may follow you at or, you know, all that jazz? Yeah, uh, Twitter uh, at Matt M. Bartlett. Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, there's an author page and a personal page that I pretty much just use both of them, uh, and mainly in personal page. And it's just my name, Matthew M. Bartlett. Um, and uh, Instagram, I don't even remember what the hell I am on Instagram. You could probably find me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about Instagram, too. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm always Very- like, oh, yeah, there's also Instagram. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I and think I have, I have a website, Matthew Bartlett.com and WXXT.com. Great, great. Yeah, I think I have a Snapchat, but I have no clue what it is or who <laughs> I follow or what's going on. Yeah, it's like uh, yeah. something the kids set up for me. <laughs> yeah, <good>. sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Oren, where can they find more of your stuff? Um, as always, I am Oren Gray, every place at uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, not Snapchat, because um, I don't know what it is either, because <laughs> I am an old. Um, but, uh, Instacart. I'm also on Instacart. To get <laughs> yeah. My groceries out. yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> all those things that Donald Trump got banned from, right, we all yeah. have yeah, that. We're all, we're all on those, yeah. That's yeah. right. I'm Parlor. I'm big on Parlor right now. <laughs> I, think. I think we're all big on Parlor right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, 
I love it. Well, you can find more of my stuff on Twitter at Ty Unsel. Otherwise, uh, check out SignalHorizon.com. We're putting out new content every day. Um, we absolutely are having a blast looking at all the new horror uh, stuff that's going to come out here in 2021. If you want to write with us, if you want to maybe join the podcast sometime, send me an email at Tyler at SignalHorizon.com. Uh, I would love to, to hear your pitches. I'm always looking for new writers and new folks to uh, bring into the fold. One last time, Matthew Bartlett, thank you so much for coming on, man. This was a, an absolute blast. You know, best of luck as uh, 2021 gets off. And, uh, you know, can't wait to read these new short stories that are coming out, man. Thank you. And it's great to see you, Oren, and great to see you. And I very much appreciate you having me on. You bet. Well, right. next next week, uh, you can see Orin and I as we return to the land of folk horror as we check out Blood on Satan's Claw. Until then, class dismissed. <laughs>